Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Michael Granado. I'm a history and philosophy educator. And in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the French philosopher Henry Bergson's objections to Einstein. Now, I've made several videos on this topic, and I've made a few videos on Bergson himself, and I've also made a video on Bergson's debate with Einstein. I'm not going to get into a lot of those details here. If you want some more historical as well as philosophical context about how the debate happened, why the debate happened, and the contents of the debate itself, you can check out my video on the Bergson-Einstein debate, which I will put the link to in the description of this video. I would like for this video specifically to be a little bit more in-depth with Bergson's objections, and we'll dig a little bit into Bergson's philosophy, but I also have a separate video on Bergson's philosophy of time. I'll touch upon some of those concepts, specifically Bergson's notion of duration in this video, but I'll also link that video if you want to get a general overview of Bergson's philosophy of time. Now, I'm guessing if you've clicked to watch this video, you already have some understanding of Bergson, but I do want to make some quick uh, book recommendations in case you're kind of new to Bergson or interested in Bergson's philosophy or just philosophy in general. The first of which that has kind of, where are we at? Right here. Uh, the first of which that has really inspired me is a book that I wish I would have written, although Canals goes in way more depth than I could ever hope to, is The Physicist and the Philosopher by Dr. Canals. I'll, I'll link this. It's an absolutely fantastic book that goes over the historical context of the Bergson-Einstein debate that happened in 1922, but it also covers the content of the debate itself, why they disagreed, what Bergson's and Einstein's responses to each other's was and um it also mentions i have to give a I, i'm giving the book a shout out because it's uh it covers the philosopher that i'm really interested in gaston bachelard um, who responded to bergson and who is kind of writing on the heels of the bergson einstein debate but highly recommend the book it's written for an academic audience over here again an academic audience, yes, but it's also just very readable. Canals is a, is a fantastic writer. And the other book I want to give a quick shout out to is Power's uh, Introduction to the Philosophy of Time. Um, highly recommend. Short-ish, concise, good information. It's got some information on Bergson, and it's also got a section on Bergson's objections to Einstein. Now, Bergson himself was a very prolific writer and wrote on all sorts of different topics, but what I'm focusing on here specifically is his philosophy of time, his objections to Einstein, and with that, we really have three books that are kind of central and crucial to this, the first of which is Bergson's Time and Free Will. I personally have found that Bergson's Time and Free Will is the most like concise introduction to Bergson's philosophy of time. It's it's in this book that he does, in in my opinion, where I've gotten most of my information in, in terms of like the, the definitions that he's kind of building his framework on specifically his idea of duration, I think is most clearly articulated in time and free will. Just my personal opinion, any Bergson scholar out there, feel free to disagree. The other book I want to give a shout out to is Matter and Memory, because Bergson's objections to Einstein is really kind of fundamentally rooted in his understanding of consciousness, of temporal consciousness. Matter and Memory has a lot of good information on that. But most importantly, Bergson wrote a, so Bergson and Einstein meet in 1922, have this little spat, disagreement, debate, I'm not quite, I guess academic debate. It's not like they were like yelling at each other or anything like that, but they have this meeting and then Bergson writes a response to Einstein's theory of relativity in a book, Duration and Simultaneity. That's really his response to relativity, the, the theoretical aspect of, of relativity, which we will we'll touch upon, I will touch upon in this video. But these are the three sources that I'm primarily drawing upon from this. I'll have some quotes in this video, but if you're interested in Bergson and if you're interested in Bergson's philosophy of time, those are the works that you want to check out. So like I touched upon, um, the reason why Bergson has such an issue with Einstein stems from his own philosophy of time and his own understanding of this notion of duration. For Bergson, the, the bedrock of time, the kind of the, the foundation for our understanding of time is rooted in our conscious experience 
of duration. I want to read you this quote from Time and Free Will. So Bergson starts off by saying that pure duration is the form which the secession of our conscious states assumes when our ego lets itself live, when it refrains from separating its present state from its former states, nor need it forget its former states. It is enough that in recalling these states, it does not set them alongside its actual state. I'm not quite sure why. Got some typos in here. I apologize. I'm not sure why state is capitalized. Um, set, does not set them alongside its actual state as one point alongside another, but forms both the past and the present states and into, sorry, not and to, into an organic whole as happens when we call the notes of a tune melting, so to speak, into one another. So pure duration is this conscious experience that we all have. And this is framed oddly, I guess, for some. I mean, it's it's early 20th century philosophy. It, it's going to be in French philosophy on top of that. So we got the translation issue. It's going to be a little dense, a little complicated. But the idea here is that all of you who are reading this and who are listening to this, I guess I should say, have experienced this pure duration is when we're not critically analyzing our thoughts, when we're just sitting there experiencing reality as it comes to us. Pure duration is this seamless transition, right? We can't exactly mark the, the, the clear distinction between past and present. It's the seamless transition, the seamless flow from the past to the present that we are consciously aware of. There's a, of several different analogies that Bergson will draw on to explain and to kind of highlight exactly what he means by duration. But the analogy of melody, the example of music is probably his strongest example here. So think about your favorite song or any song, really, the last song that you heard. Bergson's idea of duration is that you experience that song as a whole, so to speak. Now, if you analyze music, you can break down a song into different parts of the song. Maybe you could break down the song into the, the introduction, uh, the first stanza. I'm thinking of poetry. <laughs> what is the first part? The first segment verse. There we go. The first verses of the song followed by the choir, then the verse, and then the choir. You can tell I don't, I don't have a background in music, but hopefully you understand what I mean. And then you can break it down even further, specifically if you do have a background in music, you can break down the song into the different notes that composes the melody that you're hearing, so to speak. But Bergson's point here is that when you listen to a song, that's not really what you're doing. You're experiencing the song. You're hearing the melody as a whole, uninterrupted. Your brain's not breaking down each part and then saying, okay, we heard this note and that note. So that's what we're going to, well, your brain might be doing that, but you are not doing that. You're consciously experiencing the song as a whole is Bergson's argument. He gives a, goes a little bit more in depth later on in time and free will with this idea of, of sound and melody. Here Bergson gives the example of a bell. The sounds of a bell certainly reach me one after the other, but one of two alternatives must be true. Either I retain each of these successive sensations in order to combine it with the others and form a group which reminds me of an air or rhythm that I know. In that case, I do not count the sounds. Going back to what I was saying before, I limit myself to gathering, so to speak, the qualitative impression produced by the whole series. Or, alternatively, else I intend explicitly to count them, then I shall have to separate them, and this separation must take place within some homogeneous medium which the sounds, stripped of their quality, and in a manner empty, leave traces of their presence, which are absolutely alike. So duration can, can qualify as that homogeneous medium in which the sound takes place, so to speak. And it's we can get a couple of uh, distinctive characteristics of duration from these quotes that I just read. The first of which is that duration is indivisible. That pure duration, as we experience it, cannot be separated, cannot be broken apart. Now, at this point, you may want to ask, well, like, 
you one way want to break it down like well how how long is a duration how is there like a certain time associated with it and bergson's going to inherently resist kind of the numerical breakdown of duration and we'll talk about it might seem a little confusion at confusing as to why that's the case, but we'll talk about that a little bit here later. But duration is not something that is quantifiable, to put it that way. It's not something that's either psychologically or physically quantifiable. It's just our, it's just your conscious experience of it. And this is what really lies at the root, the core of Bergson's objection to Einstein. This is why he finds Einstein's ideas so problematic. And this is exactly what he says to Einstein in their meeting in 1922. To give you a brief quote here that I think best summarizes Bergson's position, common sense believes in a single time, the same for all beings and all things. Where does this belief come from? Where do we get our idea of time? Where do we get our knowledge of time? Each of us feels that we endure. This duration that I just explained and talked about, the conscious experience of duration, is the very flow, continuous and undivided, of our inner life. So that's kind of the theoretical basis where Bergson's coming from in his objections. I want to move on to the actual objections themselves, if we can kind of formulate these into an argument, kind of two arguments that that build off of each other. But duration is the foundation, the epistemological basis of our understanding of time, according to Bergson. And as a result, we can kind of infer some substantive properties of duration. There are certain key characteristics that duration and by extension that time has. The first and the most important one of those characteristics is that is that real time duration is continuous it's indivisible it can't be split up or divided and this gets this brings us to a fundamental distinction that lies at the heart of bergson's philosophy of time and this is the distinction between physical time on the one hand physical time we can physical time mathematical time i say physical here physical in the sense that it's the time that is described by physics, the time that is present in Einstein's theory of relativity. Physical time is separate and distinct from, quote unquote, real time, lived time, the time of our lives. So let's dig a little deeper here into this distinction. So physical time is discrete, it's discontinuous, and ultimately it's quantifiable. We can measure it. We can separate it. We can put it in our equations. It's the time that we're able to measure and to put labels on. Physical time, according to Bergson, is a, quote, measurable magnitude, is quantifiable. And this is what he's getting at with this quote that I have here on the slide. This is coming from uh, Time and Free Will. I didn't label it, but it's from Time and Free Will. I say that a minute has just elapsed, and I mean by this that a pendulum beating the seconds has completed 60 oscillations. And if I picture the 60 oscillations to myself, I say that oscillations, oscillations, oscillations to myself, I do not think of 60 strokes which secede one another, but of 60 points on a fixed line, each one of which symbolizes an oscillation. So the separation here from Bergson seems to lie in the fact that physical time does not necessarily correspond to our conscious experience of time. So as a result, Bergson treats the time that's talked about in the experiments of physics, that is the, the kind of thought experiments that's proposed by Einstein and other physicists, that he treats this time as purely theoretical, purely hypothetical. It's used as a way to kind of push these measurements forward, and it's used as a way to mathematicalize to, to quantify, <laughs> mathematicalize, to quantify the, to quantify our experiences in order for them to fit within the kind of scientific worldview, so to speak. I don't know if I want to phrase it that way because this kind of situates Burks and is anti-scientific, which is what uh, the, the English philosopher Bertrand Russell tried to do. He's not 
anti-scientific in his in his in his thinking, uh, and to label Bergson as anti-intellectual or anti-scientific is to fall into to Russell's trap, and is kind of the reason why Bergson has been uh, sidelined for most of the 20th century. There's been a, a revival recently, but um, they're coming from two different places. Like I said, so Bergson's idea of duration is rooted in conscious experience, which he seems to think is separate from the physical descriptions being offered by physicists. So that, that's what I meant by that. But the time of the physicist, Bergson is saying, is, is hypothetical, it's theoretical, and not necessarily descriptive of our conscious life. And this is kind of what's reflected in this next quote that I want to get to. And this is coming from his book, uh, Duration and Simultaneity, which I've, again, forgot to label here. Uh, Bergson said, when a space traveler or a clock moves away from us at high speed, this is in direct reference to Einstein, as you can tell, moves away from us at high speed, the moving objects are no more than phantoms of the physicist imagination. The mathematical calculations of STR, STR here is referring to the special theory of relativity. The mathematical calculations of STR apply only to such phantom images. They may be a multiplicity of imaginary times in STR, but there is nevertheless a single real time. So we can get these theoretical speculations about the nature of time. We could talk about different uh, frames of reference for different observers. But Bergson's point is that in reality, there's only one duration that each person experiences. That's not to say that uh, Bergson discounts the mathematical basis of the general theory of relativity relativity as a whole he doesn't if you if you read Bergson he actually uh, ag agrees with relativity he's not objecting to the mathematical or even the theoretical basis of what Einstein's saying Bergson actually has a background in mathematics and is probably one of the few people in the world at the time that can kind of follow along with what these physicists were saying because of that background that's not what he's objecting to He's just, again, drawing that fundamental distinction between the time that's talked about in the physics equations and the time in which we live our daily lives. He doesn't believe that those calculations are capturing that time. So the mathematical time of physics is separated, according to Bergson, from that real time, the real experience of duration. And real time is the time that we consciously experience, and it's a time that is indivisible, can't be divided up. Duration or the continuity of time lies at the heart of our conscious experience. Again, going back to those first quotes that I introduced. What we experience is in fact a continuous duration that is not subject to the arbitrary divisions of physics. It is not subject to mathematical divisions. In this duration, we experience an indivisible flowing, going back to that very first quote about duration, an individual flowing of the past into the present moment. Pure duration, according to Bergson, therefore lacks a homogeneous medium or measurable quantity. That is to say, the time of our immediate experience can, cannot be broken into parts. We can, of course, impose parts or units of measurement onto real time, but the difficulty here, the confusion, is when we mistake those parts for the real thing. Bergson does not deny the utility of the mathematical measurements or of what Einstein's doing in physics, but such measurements are simply the measurements of an abstracted world and not of reality. The crucial mistake, according to Bergson, is confusing those measurements for the real thing. So to get at an example that I think highlights what Bergson is talking about, uh, kind of a categorical mistake in reasoning that he believes that physics is making, um, we can look to an example from history. Maybe this won't be a, a good example for you, but uh, my background as a history teacher, I can kind of see and understand where Bergson's coming from. So historians, archaeologists, academics in general will divide human history up into different periods. This is reflected if you've ever taken like a world history one class or world history two class in college. These periods are often characterized. We can characterize these periods by distinctive 
creative developments. But it's important to keep in mind, and I, I try to stress this to my class, that although we are kind of abstracting and talking about these periods as a whole and talking about the general characteristics as a whole, that it's important to remember that it is an abstraction, an abstraction that is separated from the actual lived experience of those people. All of that to say that these labels might be useful in an academic setting. It might be useful if I'm teaching a class on world history one to divide up the ancient world between the classical world and the medieval world. But these labels don't actually capture anything substantive with respect to the people themselves. Bergson's major takeaway here is that time is more than just the sum of its parts that we oppose upon it. And the flow or the experience of time cannot be fully explained by the labeling of those parts. So hopefully that makes sense because the second objection is kind of building off of that first objection. So not only do we have this distinction between real time and mathematical time, but Bergson takes this a step further and argues that the sort of time described by relativity does not actually match our experience of time. And therefore, this is a basis for thinking that the description of time by relativity is, is purely theoretical and not an actual description of our, or not applicable to our lived experience. Relativity is an inadequate explanation for our experience of time, which is why Bergson thinks his explanation still holds water, that we still need to explore time through our conscious experience of time. Bergson argues that the physical concept of simultaneity outlined in Einstein, Einstein's theory needs to match our experience of this phenomenon in order for it to be true. If Einstein's description does not match our experience, then it cannot adequately describe the relationship we experience between two simultaneous events. Rather, going back to the first objection, what it is describing is the mathematical relationship between those events. Okay, so what does Bergson think simultaneity is if we're not going with the mathematical description. Well, Bergson just relies on the kind of common sense. Now, I, I have some issues with common sense, see my other videos, but the common sense understanding of simultaneity is that it is the perception of different events happening at the same time. This is the quote that I have on the slide here from Bergson. This is simultaneity in the current meaning of the word. It is given intuitively. Intuition plays a large role in Bergson's philosophy. And simultaneity, it is absolute in that it depends on no mathematical conventions and no physical operation like the regulation of clocks. So in other words, the basic understanding of simultaneity does not depend on an understanding of the physical or mathematical operations that underline the idea. It is something which is evident to the individual who experiences this. Because of this assumption, Bergson extends his understanding of simultaneity to an absolute degree. As Bergson explains, common sense does not hesitate to extend it, our understanding of simultaneity, to events as distant from each other as possible. We can assume that it means the same thing regardless of the context in which we find ourselves. So Bergson is building an argument about time from our conscious experience of it. And as a result, because of his basis of duration and consciousness, he does not have to rule out that the relations between two simultaneous events, um, he does not have to rule out that absolute simultaneity is impossible. Einstein has to rule it out because of his kind of verificationist approach to, to experience, into science, to experiments in science, I should say, and because he's basing his understanding uh, his definitional understanding of simultaneity on mathematics, whereas Bergson's basing it on conscious experience, which is why they're reaching two different conclusions about 
its meaning and how we can understand it. So absolute simultaneity for Bergson at least is not impossible. It's it's feasible. Now you have to create a lot of abstraction for it to be feasible, but theoretically somebody no matter how far apart an event is, if you take some like godlike figure for example that's observing two events in let's say two different parts of the universe light years apart theoretically they could experience that at the same time just like me on a local level if i drops uh, i drop two things at the same time i could experience that as a simultaneous event it, it's theoretical that some omniscient observer could could do that. So this is what Bergson has to say about simultaneity. It is obvious that simultaneity implies two things. First, an instantaneous perception. And second, the capacity of our attention to divide itself without being split up. I open my eyes for a moment. I perceive two flashes. I should try to do it at the same time. (laughs) I perceive two flashes in that instant coming from two separate points. I call them simultaneous because they are both one and two at the same time. They are one in that my act of attention is individual, indivisible, sorry, yet they are two. Again, some typos on my part. Sorry about that. They are two in as much as my attention is at once shared between both of them, divided up, yet not split up. So in Bergson's view, simultaneity implies two things. The first is instantaneous perception. And the second is the capacity of our attention to divide itself, divide itself without being, without splitting itself up. And this notion of simultaneity is not dependent upon any mathematical foundations. Again, it's it's based in our intuition. It's not based in mathematical formulas. Now, Einstein will fundamentally, fundamentally reject any sort of Newtonian absolutes with respect to times or categories that we can apply to time. But Bergson is just not going to to go down that route because of one, what I told you about with his idea that absolute simultaneity could be theoretically possible. But also Bergson argues that absolute temporal categories are something, are things which are intuitively true for us based of our on our conscious experience of time probably the most concrete example that bergson gives is this idea of temporal order when bergson talks about the flow of time from the past to the present bergson's going to say that that's an absolute category and the reason why he says this is i mean feel free to try to think of an example or a case in which that's not true when we observe things happening, those things only happen in one direction. So what I mean by that, like I was cooking breakfast this morning, if I were making myself an omelet for an example, and I drop an egg and the egg falls to the countertop, cracks open and breaks, that's always in terms of, in terms of the temporal order, in terms of the temporal like cause and effect in which that happened, that's always what everybody is going to observe. You drop the egg, the egg falls to the counter and cracks. We have never observed, I'm sure there's somebody out there in YouTube land that's going to claim that they have observed this, but we've never observed the opposite happen, right? So for example, we've never observed a broken egg put itself back together. There seems to be an absolute category with respect to our temporal experience of the flow in the directionality of time. And Bergson's saying the same thing about simultaneity, that it also seems to be an absolute category, just based on our common common intuitive understanding of time. And because relativity conflicts with that basic intuition, then Bergson argues it is an inadequate description of our conscious experience. He's not saying that relativity's wrong. He's not saying that Einstein got something wrong in his theory. He's saying that there's got to be something else, that it has to be relativity and whatever. Of course, he's going to fill it in with his own philosophy of time, but there needs to be something else to describe our conscious experience. 
Okay, so those are Bergson's principal objections. I hope that that somewhat made sense. If you have questions about that, feel free to ask them. In the comments section of this video, I'll do my best to answer. This is something that I'm learning about myself. Anyway, that's all I got for this video. I will see you all next time. Thank you.